All right, again, as uh, more media are continuing to join the call, just a couple final reminders. Um, please make sure your line is muted. Also very important so we can recognize uh, who you are for questions. Please make sure that your name and outlet are labeled on your viewing screen. Uh, we will be sending out a transcript and a video recording after the uh, call is over. Remember to use the raise hand feature to get in the queue to ask a question. And then we'll prompt you to unmute your line before you ask your question. All right, everyone, I think we are about ready to get started. Welcome everyone to the joint head coach press conference for the 2021 Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl. Before we begin this morning, we're going to have a short presentation to announce the winner of the Dodd Trophy Coach of the Year Award, which, as you know, is managed by Peach Bowl, Inc. So to make that announcement, we're going to welcome now Gary Stoken, president and CEO of Peach Bowl, Inc. Go ahead, Gary. Thanks, Matt. Welcome, everybody. We appreciate uh, your support, your interest in the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl. And uh, so we welcome you to this year's game. I uh, want to take special admiration to the uh, ADs, all the medical people, the trainers, the coaches, the staffs, and uh, more importantly, the players for uh, our admiration for what they've had to sacrifice this year. So we extend our attitude of gratitude to them. Um, in 2014, Peach Bowl Inc. officially assumed the management of what has been recognized as college football's most coveted coaching award, the Dodd Trophy. The Dodd Trophy is named for legendary Georgia Tech coach Bobby Dodd and was established in 1976 to honor the FBS football coach whose program represents three pillars of success, scholarship, leadership, and integrity. The award honors the coach of a team with a successful season on the field, but equally as important stresses the importance of academic excellence and a desire to give back to their community. This year's recipient had 69 players earn academic all-conference honors in 2020, a record for the program. Under his leadership, his program is ranked in the top three among all FBS programs in the multi-year academic progress rating for 10 consecutive years. The team has also earned the highest graduation success rate among all FBS programs for four straight years and became the first Power Five team ever to post a perfect score in 2019. In the community, he was named honorary coach of the 2017 All-State AFCA Good Works team for demonstrating a unique dedication to community service and desire to make a positive impact on the lives of others. On the field, this year's winner is now the second longest tenured coach in the Big Ten and surpassed 100 career rec victories at his school earlier this year. He is the all-time winningest coach at his university and has secured four of the five bowl wins in program history. Under his leadership this year, he guided his team to a program second Big Ten West Division title and a berth in the Big Ten Championship game. On behalf of the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl and the Bobby Dodd Coach of the Year Foundation, we're proud to honor Northwestern head coach Pat Fitzgerald as the recipient of the 2020 Dodd Trophy. Before I turn it back to Matt, I would like to mention that uh, we're blessed to have uh, negotiated and signed 
with our partner Chick-fil-A, uh, a new contract going forward with both the uh, Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl and the Chick-fil-A kickoff games. And lastly, uh, in this day and time of uh, giving up things, uh, we take great pride in being the number one bowl organization in charitable contribution. It's part of our mission. We will donate over $5 million this year to various scholarships and charities from Peach Bowl Inc. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Matt and uh, we'll welcome the two head coaches. Thank you. All right, thank you, Gary. Um, all right, coaches, if you could go ahead and, and get the coaches joined on video. Uh, again, we'll uh, please use the raise hand feature and we'll get you in the queue for a question. All right, so we are now joined by our two head coaches. Coaches, we'll start with uh, opening remarks uh, from each of you. And, and Coach Smart, we will start with you. We'll welcome Georgia head coach Kirby Smart, head coach of the ninth-ranked Georgia Bulldogs. Go ahead, Coach, when you're ready. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate it. Uh, just want to say thanks again to Gary and his staff. Uh, I've known these guys so long. They've always done a, such a tremendous job with the uh, Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl. I've uh, been a part of my entire career, which we've mentioned a lot uh, during during the week, having played in it, coached in it, uh, and been a part of it. Uh, still uh, disappointed that both teams don't get to enjoy the city of Atlanta because uh, as they do as fine a job as anybody in the country of entertaining uh, your players uh, during this week. And that's always kind of the culmination of a season is when you bring all those players together and they get to enjoy the, the sights and sounds and the venues and the food all over Atlanta, so I hate that. But our guys have had a good work week. It seems like it's kind of been a different uh, bowl. We didn't get a lot of bowl practice before Christmas, um, but since the break, you know, it's been unique that you're practicing kind of at your own location the entire time. It makes it more like a, a road game, you know, because your prep, your prep is all at home, uh, and then you get ready to go to the bowl site. But um, got a lot of respect for Luke and the Cincinnati football team. Uh, what a tremendous job they've done there. and. Uh, the more and more you watch these guys, the more and more you understand why they win. Um, they're really sound fundamentally, do really good things uh, on offense, defense, and special teams. And like I've said over and over, the balance across the three main phases uh, is as good as we've played. They just don't have uh, holes and they don't have weaknesses. And anytime you've got the number of seniors they got, uh, it speaks volumes to their ability to retain players, um, but also to keep those guys engaged and have them develop and become uh, good football players in their program. So we're excited, and uh, we know we'll have a great turnout um, and ready to get to Mercedes-Benz. All right. Thank you, Coach. All right. We'll now welcome uh, Head Coach Luke Fickle of the eighth-ranked Cincinnati Bearcats. Coach, uh, go ahead with your opening remarks on on your the state of your team and, and getting ready to face Georgia. Well, thanks, Matt. Um, thanks, Gary. Uh, as Kirby says, I, we, I have never been here, so I have not had the uh, luxury of actually being in the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl um, as a player or as a coach, and uh, been fortunate to play a lot of a lot of bowl games and coaching a lot of bowl games, um, but uh, have not. So it's it's kind of tough to say. We're, hey, we're really excited about it. We'd love even coming down last night, having a great dinner, um, you know, and, and having our guys together. It's obviously different for our guys. What they know is the Birmingham Bowl and uh, maybe the Military Bowl. <clears throat> even though we were there for a little bit longer in different venues to practice and things, uh, they definitely know that there's a difference. And uh, I think that that's what they're excited about. Uh, I said it earlier that uh, obviously Coach Smart and them have done an unbelievable job. And I think this is the best football team that we've played since I've been at Cincinnati. And um, I might catch a little bit. We played Ohio State last year. In the, but it was the second game of the season. I don't think that they were or didn't think they were where they were by the end of the year. And, and, uh, but this is a really good football team. Um, again, the same thing, all three phases with incredible players and athletes. Uh, it's going to be a great challenge, but I think for us and our program, you know, for me as a coach and our guys as players, the only way you can measure yourself and and what you've grown to be and what you've done is to play against the best. And so it's it's a unique opportunity for us to enjoy what we've um, had the opportunity to make it to. Uh, so I keep trying to remind those guys to not be satisfied for where we are right now, uh, but in a great way for us to measure us as individuals. Uh, but really to measure us as a program to see where we are, uh, where we've come, um, and how we match up against some of the very best. So we're excited. Uh, can't get here soon enough. 
Uh, I think everything from about noon on today will go pretty quick. Uh, the last game we played was a 8.30 game or 8.20 game. So I think our guys are, you know, obviously excited about getting up and getting rolling uh, on New Year's Day. All right, thanks for that, Coach. Uh, all right, we are now open to questions for the media. Again, please uh, click to raise your hand and we will take the questions in the order they're coming in. All right, we will lead off with uh, Justin Williams. Go ahead. Coach, I know you've talked about Coach Figgle. You've talked about the goal for, for your team being to play in and, and win conference championships. Obviously, you've done that this year, but you kind of referenced how this bowl game is different than maybe what you guys have played in the past couple of years. How has that impacted your approach in talking with the team leading up to this one? Well, I don't think it's changed the approach. Obviously, this year is a unique year and how you prepare for a bowl. Um, I still think it's got the same, whether you're playing in the Birmingham Bowl or the Military Bowl, uh, it's still you have the same things in mind that you got to be able to do, and that's the prep and prepare different this year than you know maybe the development of young guys that you usually get in bowl practice. Um, but it doesn't change how we go about things. I just think it's a greater opportunity for our program and for our young men uh, to really measure themselves and to measure where we've come as individuals and as, as a group um, against the very best. So in some ways, the out, what you do, what you prepare for is no different, but I think your ability to kind of step back and really kind of analyze what it is that you've done and what you're, where you're headed, um, you get a lot greater feel uh, playing against a team like Georgia. All right, we'll take our next question from Anthony Dasher. Hey, Coach. Uh, I just want to start by offering my condolences to James, for James Cook's dad. And I just want to ask me, how is, is James doing, you know, under these horrible circumstances? How has the team try to rally around him? Well, you know, he's not with us. It's uh, really unfortunate. He, he got the news. I forget what day of the week it is now. I'm lost. But two days ago, he uh, – he woke up to the news. His father had passed. He immediately um, talked to Dale, Coach McGee, and uh, reached out. And uh, we, 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 he already actually already had a flight, so he got a flight home. I think with Dalvin, and he wanted to go home and be with his uh, family. And we certainly understand that and support him. And you know, everybody handles these kind of things differently. And and and, and James was close with his dad, and uh, tough tough environment for him. I know all the running backs have reached out to him, spoke with him. Uh, I've spoke with him a couple of times. He's, you know, he's, he's dealing with it the best he can and uh, appreciates all the support of dog nation and all our fan base. And um, you just heart goes out for him because the timing of this, if you remember last year in the bowl game, he got hurt early mm -hmm. in the game against uh, Baylor and didn't get to finish out the game. So um, I know that he knows he's got a lot of football ahead of him and uh, football is going to, going to be there. Um, for a long time, and this is a time for him to be with his family, and we certainly understand that as coaches and appreciate that. All right, we'll take our next question from uh, Chip Towers of the AJC. Go ahead, Chip. Um, yeah, can you hear me? I apologize. I've been having uh, internet issues, so if you address this already, I, I guess for both coaches, but Kirby, you expressed a lot of uh, concern at the beginning of the week about COVID and everything. I guess at this point, you've about exhausted all those tested and all that are you are you guys going to lose anybody as a re result of it and coach fickle yeah you too will you have any players out um as a result of this virus start with coach smart please yeah chip i haven't really addressed that all year you know it's not something that i'm going to start addressing now so um you know that's not with the importance is our health and safety of our players and the protocols that we have in place are there to protect not only our players, but Cincinnati's players. And I respect both uh, conferences policies. Um, they've got their testing policies. They follow. We've got our testing policies. We follow and we follow those to this point. And uh, the guys that are able to play, will be out there to play. And the ones that won't, unfortunately won't be able to play, but we've kind of dealt with this all year and, you know, we don't disclose the stuff. All right. Now, Coach Fickle. Same thing. I think that the, the misconception sometimes is obviously there's we all have issues with COVID and we're all battling through the tough times. But the things that happen because of COVID as well, you know, that, that really add up. And uh, I don't know that everybody kind of understands that. It's like only thing you think about is COVID. And there are a lot of things that happen on the back end, whether it's, you know, you've missed practices, you've had time off, guys get, um, you know, aren't as healthy. Uh, and it's not just their lungs, it's not just the virus, it's the things that 
you know, happen from guys being off. So um, we're in the same boat. I mean, I, we leave that to the medical staff. Um, you know, I, I think that our travel has been really good. We've been really smart, um, you know, and they've done a great job here at the hotel. So uh, hopefully as of now, we won't, uh, we won't have much of any other issues and us as coaches can kind of maybe take a couple of deep breaths and know who we got. All right, we'll take our next question from Mike Griffith. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, good morning, Kirby. You mentioned the other day the, the elasticity of, of 2020 uh, wearing thin, and yet when we talked with your players and, and your assistants, most of them were saying, yeah, we wish we could play, you know, more games this season. Can you speak to that, that resiliency and what's happened for your program? It seems like the end of the year you guys have caught some momentum. And then also – uh, the black jersey decision. I mean, was that you or was that your leadership group that decided they wanted to wear those? You'll have to ask Gary Stoken about that decision. That came from uh, that came from the higher powers uh, that be. Um, but as far as the elasticity, and I think that uh, all our players would rather have played a complete season. You know, we got one game uh, kind of taken from us that we weren't able to play and certainly would have liked to have played that. I mean, if you ask the players, they would have liked to have played the non-conference opponents we had in terms of, you know, starting out with UVA, I think they're always going to say they want to play. Um, the, but we have to play by the standards and the rules and the safety precautions we have in place, and rightfully so. So um, I know that uh, each and every guy, including myself, would love to have been able to compete and played every game we possibly could have. I'm sure uh, Coach Fickle would have loved to have played some, you know, out-of-conference games as well because that gives you a chance to go out and, represent your conference and go and, and play others. And you really find out a lot more about where you are when you get a chance to do that. Uh, but unfortunately, we haven't been able to do that. And in regards to the, the black jerseys, that, that, that was probably more so a, a, a Gary uh, request. And, that, and we're, we're obliged with those. Those kids like wearing those. And I, I don't know exactly the whole deal, but I think it has something to do with both teams wearing their, their home jerseys. All right, we'll take our next uh, question from Vance Levy from Bulldog Illustrated. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, first of all, uh, just for both coaches, congratulations on navigating what had to be a long nine or so months. Uh, and again, questions for both uh, coaches. Uh, are you in favor of a, moving to an eight-game playoff? And then a question that you'll probably answer uh, – is there one aspect of your of who you will be playing tomorrow that worries you the most? We'll start with Coach Fickle this time. Well, yeah, I think that uh, all of us want to continue to play, and I, I, it's such a. I mean, we could you could talk for hours and hours and hours and days and days about the playoff system and, and what's going to happen. I I think I heard Mac Brown uh, or somebody told me Mac Brown said something last night that really made sense to me. And you know, when you start to have more guys that, you know, maybe don't play um, in the bowl games, so to speak, opt out, whatever it is. Uh, I think the way to continue to keep, you know, the, the stakes high and, and keep those guys involved might be some way somehow of, of you know, expanding uh, the playoffs. I, I think that's a better idea than just the, hey, well, we need to give uh, a team like Cincinnati an opportunity to be in the playoffs. And the only way we're going to do that is by expanding – everybody earns an opportunity to be in the playoffs and sometimes the chips don't fall where they fall. You know, you get your non-conference games canceled and, and you don't, aren't probably going to have an opportunity. So I don't think we expand just to try to include everybody, but maybe to expand because it's going to keep the kids and the players and more involved, um, which gives our programs a better opportunity uh, to have the success and, and, and at least finish off the season the way you'd want to as a whole. Um, so I think that, uh, that there's a lot of things to be said about that. And Coach Smart? Yeah, I would concur with Luke. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm always, I've always been of the opinion that the, the, the decisions and the outcomes and the championships and the trophies should be decided on the field. Um, and it's harder and harder every year to agree that it's decided on the field um, because there's, you know, somebody arguably that's left out and, I always go back to the year that we were in it and, you know, Alabama sits at home and doesn't play in an SEC championship game. They're the four seed. You could argue that that in fact may have helped them with one less game, but they won a national championship from a four seed, you know, and what's to say that the fifth seed, sixth seed or seventh seed doesn't get hot, doesn't play well, 
doesn't have an opportunity to win. But the, the problem I have is, is where that clear line le leads to what number that is. To say that it's just eight because that's, you know, double four, I think you're going to have major issues at nine and ten because if you'd done that this year, you could argue that, that Luke and I would be sitting here saying that we should be in. Um, so you're going to have to pick a number. But if we're going to do it, I would be much more in favor of saying, all right, let's, let's go to 12, you know, and have eight teams play out. Maybe the first four get, get a bonus or a buy or something like that. But I, I, I just would rather go further than eight if we're going to do it. Um, I certainly think that if they did that, somebody within that back five, six, seven, eight is going to win a national championship at some point. And that's giving everybody a realistic shot. I mean, at the end of the day, how are all college sports decisions made? You know, they're, they're done on the field. They're done in a championship environment. And we're one of the few uh, that's not done that way. So it makes it different. And I'm sure people can argue uh, just the opposite of that as well. All right, we'll take our next question from Seth Emerson from The Athletic. Go ahead, Seth. Uh, mainly for Kirby, the fans, when it comes to players that haven't played a lot, that get more exposure in this poll, they'll, and us, we'll see the game itself is there as much, if not more value in these guys getting more practice reps leading up to the game? Uh, I'm not understanding your question. You're saying an example of last year, a guy that plays in. I mean, in general, we're, we're going to see guys playing a little bit more than they did during the season, like Zamir and Lewis maybe did in last year's bowl. But do guys in this situation get as much, is there as much value in practice reps as there is in what we see on the field in the actual game? I don't think so because those guys like last year, you, you, you take Lewis and Zamir, they, they would have got a ton of practice reps in bowl practice last year. Okay. Like we don't, we don't wish practice the ones obviously, right. We practice everybody. So they would have been with the twos and they would have got a lot of uh, reps, a lot of same amount of work. I mean, sometimes in bowl prep before we get ready for the game, we actually do more reps with the twos because the ones have had the body of work. They've played the most snaps. So in a traditional bowl year, we would double up on the twos and threes. They would get more work, okay? And then in the game, the ones would end up playing more. And I also think you can't value that practice experience they get over that game experience they get. So I would argue that the game experience is what's so valuable because they get tons of practice experience. What they don't get is that game experience that the nerves of I've got to go out there and be the guy. And obviously every team in bowl season because of injuries, COVID, opt-outs, whatever, there's going to be some guys that play probably more at one position than they have all year. And you find out a lot about them in these bowl games when they get an opportunity to go play. All right, we'll go next to Anthony Dasher. Hey, Coach. Uh, obviously, this is going to be another year where your offensive line is going to feature a little different look with, uh, with Ben not there and Trey's injury. Can you speak yet to how that's going to, uh, to look uh, Friday afternoon? Yeah, we've practiced a lot of combinations there. We really, I mean, Trey was out, you know, Trey was already mm -hmm. for the last game, so that's not something new. Um, we feel like Van Fran's grown up a lot over this time, and he's going to be able to play some at center and get some work. He's also worked at guard. Warren played in this game last year as a guard, but he played the last game at center, you know, and Jamari has played a lot of guard last year, and he's also played tackle. So Xavier Trust, Roderick Jones, I'm excited to see all those guys go out and play. So I completely answered your question, Anthony. All right, we'll go for the next question. We'll go back to Justin Williams. Go ahead, Justin. Uh, Coach Fickle, you're going to be excited to answer this question too. Um, Jared Dokes and James Wiggins were a little bit banged up in the uh, title game a couple weeks ago. Do you have any updates on their status heading into tomorrow? Well, we've got another practice today, so we usually don't make those decisions till after the practice today to see how uh, see how they are. Um, but that's kind of some of those things that you're talking that I was talking about earlier about everybody just talks about COVID <clears throat> and there's a lot of other um, factors that even come along with maybe some of the COVID, you know, James Wiggins uh, coming back from COVID and being off for 14, 15 days. Um, that's where we saw happen with him um, in the last game. So we don't know. I mean, there, there's, we still got some time left and we'll, we'll go out there and practice today and, and uh, see who we've got. All right, we'll take our next question from Anthony Patterson. Go ahead, Anthony. Hey, Coach Kirby and Coach Luke. Um, my question was for both of y'all. Um, just with 2020, how the season's played out, with the pandemic, college football, and having to adjust, um, how does it, how will you guys, what lessons will 
both of your teams take from this season just moving forward, whether you win or lose. And just another question, the uniforms are nice. Uh, fans are really liking it. Um, can your fan bases expect a little bit more moving forward, even though it's a little early to say so? Start with Coach Smart. Yeah, the, the thing I would take from 2020 is uh, mental agility. I mean, you, you just better be able to change. Walking on the practice field when you find out so-and-so's out, next guy's got to bump up and he had all the reps and the other guy's got to take them. And you literally found out at flex because it took them, you know, 27 hours to get the test results back. You, you better be able to adapt and change rapidly and never, ever, 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 ever give up. You know what I mean? Like, don't quit on it. Just keep fighting, keep pushing through because we're teaching our kids some valuable lessons. There's a lot of people in the world today, in America today, that have, I'm not going to say use COVID, maybe use the pandemic to maybe do less. These kids have actually done more, <laughs> okay? They've done more through the pandemic because they had to work twice as hard to stay, as avail stay available. They had to practice twice some weeks, meaning practice for Missouri once, practice for Missouri again, practice for Vandy once, practice for Vandy again, practice longer. So the, the, the fact I'm proud of is I had to work twice as hard and I did. I didn't take the easy road and just say, you know, it'd be easy just to say, let me stay home and, and avoid some of these things. I was really proud of them for doing that. Then as far as the uniforms, I mean, I, I, I'm one that I don't, I don't really get into the uniforms. The players do, the recruits do. So I like listening to my players when it comes to that. But a lot of our design came from Nike and they come up with the ideas and then we say whether or not we're going to uh, jump on board with it. But I, I don't like you know, distractions and things like that. If, if it's important to the players, I like for them to know beforehand. I'm not big into surprises in the locker room. All right. And now from Coach Fickle, please. I would go a lot right along with Coach Smart. For us as a coaching staff, for me as a coach, I think the ability to improvise, adapt, continue to overcome, um, never too high, never too low with all the interruptions that uh, you've had to deal with this year and starting all the way back from last March of, you know, time off and the balance between your players as you come back and your ability to, you know, kind of understand the situations. You know, we had to, we were in camp when, you know, the Big Ten and the Pac-12 canceled uh, and your ability to manage our ability to manage the, the emotions of our kids, the ups and the downs, um, I think was something that I don't think any of us as coaches will uh, ever forget and hopefully we all learn from I think for our kids in general as well as the coaches too I think that you find out a lot more about yourself in these kinds of times and uh, you know the high high-end people the high-end kids you know obviously deal with these things a lot better uh, because they're more disciplined in what they do <clears throat> so I think it has you know kind of exposed or helped in a lot of ways I told our guys as we got going I said this year this six seven months um can be a real benefit to all of us, for you guys in particular as younger, 18 to 22 year olds for the rest of your life, if you can learn and handle and manage all the things that we're gonna go through. And um, you don't really know what you're made of until you're thrown in some of those situations. And that's what I'm so excited about for our guys is to see them make a decision in camp to continue to push forward, um, not knowing what to um, what's at the other end, whether it's gonna be a bowl game or even a season you know, or a good season or a bad season and to continue to keep their heads on straight, keep pushing, keep grinding, keep going through camp. You know, we went through camp at a normal time and came back and had over almost three and a half weeks until our first game. Um, so the decisions they made, the ability to kind of handle it, the, the, has told us me a lot about them. And I know it'll be, you know, benefit them in the long run to whatever it is that they do. All right, thanks coach. We'll take our next question from Mark Weiser from the Athens Banner. Hey, this is for uh, Kirby. I wanted to ask about how many uh, early enrollees have practiced with you on campus already? And I wondered uh, your impressions, if a few may have caught your you know, eye in practice in terms of getting to see them up close uh, in that setting for the first time. Mark, I wouldn't single anybody out of that group. Uh, I can't remember. I called them up uh, yesterday was their last uh, practice and I talked to them and I don't even know exactly. I would guess and say nine, maybe eight or nine. Um, so I think we had three DBs, a linebacker, uh, two O-linemen, uh, receiver, and running back. So whatever number that is, maybe. Um, but they, they, uh, they, they all did a tremendous job. I mean, you talk about an intimidating environment. <laughs> I'm walking in, and most of these kids, they usually come where they like been on official visits, and they know guys, and they hung out with guys. I mean, literally, you know, it'd be the first time I've seen some of them face-to-face, -face, other than maybe ninth or 10th grade in camp. 
I haven't seen them, you know, I'm worried about not even recognizing them. So they, they're out at practice and uh, they did a tremendous job jumping in. They were able to help us uh, with our numbers being down. Uh, we, we, we were able to really help ourselves. Uh, and I guess I left out D-line. We had a couple of D-line there too. So they, they were really able to help us out in terms of practice and depth and give us uh, a good look. So it's always exciting to get those guys out there. Thanks. All right, we'll take our next question from Roddy Nabolsi. Go ahead, Roddy. Uh, this is for both coaches. Uh, after the Friday's game, you'll be looking towards the 2021 roster. Uh, <clears throat> the transfer portal is new to a lot of fans, media, coaches. We don't quite understand how you guys handle it. Can you give us some insight into how each staff monitors the uh, transfer portal? How, uh, who, who's watching it? How do you reach out to the kids? And how many kids have already reached out to you? All right, we'll start with Coach Fickle this time, please. That's a that's a bomb right there, to be honest with you. It's I don't I mean, it's when it first started, I think that we were monitoring it every day with our recruiting people. Um, it's overwhelming, to be honest with you. Um, now, as we've gone, we're in our fourth year in our program. <clears throat> it's not a big uh, way we want to build our program. I'm not saying we don't uh, still monitor it and look at it. We, we use it in a way that obviously can better our program and, and a lot of those guys that we have taken maybe via the transfer portal in the last couple of years are guys that are coming back home. So somebody that we've known for quite a while, uh, we recruited coming out of high school. We've got a relationship with at one point in time, um, because like anything, there's, there's a lot of, you think it might look better. Um, but the reality is it's not always the case. And then you always got to worry about your guys too. I think that I'm not a big fan of it, to be honest with you. I've said it from the get go. I don't think you want to give kids easier ways to um, take the easy route, you know, where they can throw their name in something and think it's going to be easier if they go from, you know, Georgia to Cincinnati or, you know, whatever. And uh, so I think it's, it's a balance in a lot of ways. And, and uh, I know we don't want to build our program that way, but all of us are going to use it maybe specifically on something they might need. All right. Now, Coach Smart, please. Yeah, I would just say ditto. Because I'll be honest, he said everything that, that I would want to say. Um, the only thing I would say is we don't have to monitor it because you guys do so hard that every time somebody goes in it, you write an article. So we don't, we don't, I mean, we don't, we don't have to monitor. You guys do it for us. So as soon as somebody's in it, we know. Uh, we don't like, I think people think that we have people sitting down there on the ticker checking every three minutes. But since I know y'all are checking it every three minutes, I don't, I don't, like, I don't have to because I know it's going to be the next story as soon as somebody's in it. It'll be on the front lines uh, that so and so jumped in the portal. So it's a need base uh, for us. But if I had my, my my preference, I would rather not not use the the portal because you know the schools like Cincinnati and Georgia you shouldn't have to. You should be able to go out and go recruit the right kind of guys. All right, we'll go next uh, back to Vance Levy. Uh, yeah, again, for both uh, coaches, uh, this will go down as the year of the virtual meeting and Zoom. Uh, can you talk a little bit about both the advantages of what Zoom and virtual has brought you guys and, and also the disadvantages? I guess the advantages for us would be you might save a little time uh, gathering together, you know, staff meeting. We still do most of our meetings uh, by Zoom, and uh, we, we have one or two staff meetings a week where we're all together, but to cut down risk and people being in closed spaces for long amounts of time, we do a lot of stuff by Zoom that we would have never done before. So I would say the efficiency that a coach that might be in an academic meeting, he's working on a script because they're not talking about his players. Now he's sitting on a Zoom. He's able to do what he's got to do and not have to sit in a meeting away from his office. He can be at his desk in his office uh, multitasking, um, so that can be an advantage and also be a disadvantage if it's a distraction for you. But obviously in recruiting, it's uh, very different, but you can communicate. And I, I probably never would have gone face to face with as many prospects by via Zoom if I knew that they were coming to my campus. Now I'm, 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 I'm sitting there going, well, I get to see them face to face anytime I want, whether it's by FaceTime or by Zoom. So you start to use those things more often, but that's the biggest difference for us. Okay. Coach Fickle, please. I would say no benefit <laughs> other than I become a little bit more tech savvy. And I don't know if that's a benefit. I got young kids at home that they can, if I need something done, they can teach me how to do it. But uh, I, I don't like it. 
you know, obviously it's a, it's a means for what we, you know, what we have to do this year. So it's made us improvise. If anything, it's made us learn how to adapt. Um, but, you know, we love to be face to face, I, I, you know, to have a meeting where you can't look a guy in the eye and, and get a response is, is very, very difficult. And uh, we've had to do it. Uh, we've had to manage it. Um, but we've done a better job at finding ways to still keep us together, whether they're in big, big spaces, which isn't as good either. Um, but have found those ways to, you know, create other ways to communicate. And, um, you know, big group meetings are just so tough on, on Zoom because you can't get you know, the responses or you can't tell who's not sure what's going on based on a look. Um, same thing recruiting. I just, you know, again, we have to do it, but I don't, uh, I don't enjoy it. I don't think it's, you know, whether it can help you with efficiency and maybe in time um, to really build relationships and, and get to know people, I think is really, for me, it's difficult. I know the newer age kids are much more adapt to it and heck they find dates and things on Zoom and, and, and social media. I just, <laughs> I don't think it's a good thing for uh, for us in our program, how we like to do things. All right, we'll take our next question, go back to Justin Williams from The Athletic. Uh, for Coach Fickle, kind of piggyback off the transfer question. I know you don't like the term power five and uh, and I know you guys have obviously played. So why some, do you keep saying it? Uh, you know, just to bother you right, apparently. You. Um, <laughs> and I, I know you guys have played some power five non-conference games, obviously, but in a game like this, specifically on offense, is there any impact or benefit from guys like Jerome, James Hudson, Michael Young being in this game, obviously coming from some top tier programs? Well, I think they got a better grasp of what they're going to see. And, you know, anybody that says there isn't a bit of a difference, you know, probably doesn't uh, know college football as well. And there is still a difference in a what I call the blue bloods in the top, top end and, and all the others, whether they're whatever conference they're in. Um, so I, I think in some ways, yeah, it does. I mean, James Hudson, obviously at Michigan and Michael Young at Notre Dame, I think they have a good grasp of playing against those guys. Um, you know, so I think maybe they can give some insight, but I don't know that it's, you know, going to be that much different. You know, uh, we played, you know, which is a great opportunity for us. We played Ohio State last year, which I think gives us a little bit better indication of the type of uh, players that we're going to see, um, you know, whether it's the transfer guys or the guys within our program, it's not hard to turn on the film and have an idea of what it is that you're uh, looking at that might be a lot different than what you've seen most of the year. Um, but that's what you love. If you're a competitor, what, what more could you ask for than to be able to measure yourself against the best? And that's what you challenge them for. All right, we've got time for a few more. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and get in the queue. We'll go next to Seth Emerson. Go ahead, Seth. For both coaches, I know this has been such uh, an exhausting year. Um, do you know what you're doing after this game? Are you sending your players home for a while or do you not want to risk that? Uh, and do you guys have any feel for what the next few months is, is going to look like in terms of an attempt to get back to normalcy or, or is it too hard to predict? Start with uh, coach smart this time, please. Well, uh, I've got book plans to go uh, see juniors, seniors. I mean, I'm going to visit with guys on our roster, so it never stops, Seth. I mean, you, you know that as well as anybody. It's not, I mean, it's just the beginning of the next. So there, were, there won't be any time off in terms of that for us as a staff because uh, our 2021 team will be shaped, you know, from the minute that game in, this game ends, it starts taking shape probably the second it ends. Uh, it begins to take shape. So we'll be visiting with guys, uh, sharing time with their family, sharing information, uh, making sure they can make good decisions uh, in what they do. Um, and as far as uh, for our players, school starts back January 13th, which is very unique because we've always had third or fourth start date. So they went from game back to school, which I'd never think is really fair um, for guys not to get a true break. And it's been part of the burden of, bowl game when you have a guy that goes and he has to practice the whole time he doesn't get to go home and then all of a sudden he comes right back to school so I'm very happy that our players get to disconnect a little bit and go be with their families who they haven't been able to be with and they got a little time over Christmas two three days but now they'll get uh, up until the 13th to uh, be with their families and visit and do what they need to do and then come back but we'll be in protocol when they do come back we'll continue to test and do things like that all right, Coach Fickle, please. 
Very sim. I think that uh, for our guys, um, knowing that they are have an opportunity to go home, uh, we start back on the 11th. So we'll, we'll get most all of them back to campus. The idea is the 10th. There still could be some things virtual. I mean, we got a guy that lives in Germany, you know, from Germany. So we're going to allow him to go home for two weeks. Um, but it, it, it is a good opportunity for those guys that, that have been here, haven't really gone home, haven't really probably seen their families much at all, um, to have at least hopefully nine, 10 days to be able to leave. Uh, for us as coaches, obviously, you, you've got a list of plans of you know, what you got to do for the first time. I think we are maybe have to do a little bit like what uh, Coach Smart's got to do and got to go visit with a few of our juniors just to see where they are and what they want to do. And the unique thing is you might be, I'm going to be visiting and going around and visiting with uh, probably a, but a, a bit, a few of our senior families as well because of, you know, some of the opportunities that they might have, um, which is going to keep us, you know, probably a bit busy. I'm going to try to do it as much as myself to try to give uh, hopefully some of these other guys an opportunity to get reacquainted with their families a little bit and decompress. Um, we've got plans, the same thing. We don't know how it's going to look and what's going to happen, but uh, where our plans are to get rolling back again on the 11th um, at building this team and this program uh, for the following season. And, uh, you know, I know they'll be different. I know it'll be look a little different. I know there'll be some different protocols um, and I think after a year like this, I know that we'll do some things a little bit different as well with the older guys as opposed to the young guys because, you know, we got a long way to still go, uh, especially with the young guys in our program because uh, we're going to lose a lot of really good seniors. All right, we've got time for two more questions. We'll go next to Charles Odom, and then we'll finish up with Chad Brendel. Go ahead, Charles. I hope I'm not breaking a protocol here by asking to sneak in a question to Gary, but since Kirby uh, said that you had input on the jerseys, I am guessing that had to do with, um, with, with TV, but can you, can you comment on, on, on how that worked out? Kirby is uh, too kind to me and giving me way too much credit. I know the uh, Georgia Bulldogs had the opportunity to wear the uniforms they wanted. I've always professed to, coaches and ADs in our kickoff games and bowl games. I just think the field looks great when you got both teams wearing colored uniforms. Looks great on TV, looks great on the field, but at the end of the day, um, you know, both Coach Fickle and Coach Smart made their decisions on their uniforms. I guess I should say it was uh, brought to me in a light that it, it was encouraged to be colored, and I'm assuming that we both couldn't be in red. So, therefore, <laughs> somebody couldn't be in red. So, that, that's the way it was presented to me. It wasn't uh, a narrative where we, we died to wear black. It was more we had to wear one of our two dark colors, and that only gave us two options. And I'm a lot we like have the best-looking field on. We'll I'm a lot like Kirby, too. I, I, I find out when they do the looking, reveal. Uh, All right, go, go ahead, Coach Fickle. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm just like Kirby. I find out what what we're wearing usually on Thursday of a normal game Saturday when uh, when our uh, when our social people send out the reveal because uh, we have a little small group of guys, um, three or four seniors and the strength coach that kind of decide on what we're wearing and they give me the they give me the update on it because I uh, I'm similar. I don't want some surprise, but uh, you know our kids love and enjoy you know, mixing some things up and we have an opportunity because we have some combinations to be able to do it. And it was presented to me <laughs> the same way probably was the Kirby. All right, we'll take our final question from uh, Chad Brendel from the Bearcat Journal. Go ahead, Chad. Coach, you've, you've mentioned the Ohio State game a couple times. How do you use that with these guys to say, you know, maybe it didn't happen the way we wanted it to that day in Columbus, but this is just as good a team and it allows us a chance to, to prove ourselves again on that type of stage? It's always a measuring stick. And, and I think this year, obviously being unique and the bowl game being unique, it's not as much of a bowl game experience and unfortunate for our guys. Um, so the experience is, hey, if you're a competitor, you get an incredible experience. If you were really excited about, you know, we're missing out on some things that we could have done here in Atlanta and seen, which I feel bad for those guys, but the ultimate, um, Ultimately, if you are a competitor, you get an incredible experience of playing against the very best. And we had an opportunity last year to, to measure ourselves against some of the very best and um, didn't do as well. 
So hopefully we learned as coaches and as players, there's some things you got to do a lot better when, uh, when you're playing against the best. And all those experiences give us an opportunity, hopefully, to grow. Uh, and we'll find out if we did. All right, that'll, uh, that'll wrap it up. Coaches, we thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it. Uh, well done today. Uh, we're certainly excited and looking forward to a great and, and incredible game tomorrow. We wish you the best in your final day of preparation. And we'll see you in the stadium tomorrow. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Coach.